So thank you very much. So first of all, I would, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. Uh, so uh, my lab is uh, located here in Paris at the Imaging Institute of uh, Genetic Diseases. Uh, and uh, one of uh, our main topics is to develop uh, gene therapy approaches for beta hemoglobinopathies, uh, in particular by using uh, new genome editing tools. Uh, uh, so today I will try to give you an overview of all, all, of all these um, more or less personalized genome editing tools that we can use for uh, beta hemoglobinopathies. Uh, but I will also discuss uh, uh, the clinical trial, uh, the initial clinical trial that have been uh, started uh, uh, actually here in Paris uh, before the advent of genome editing. And so uh, beta hemoglobinopathies uh, are a disease uh, affecting uh, uh, the production of the beta globin chain of the adult hemoglobin tetramer that is indeed composed of two beta globin chain and two alpha chains. And uh, during the development, uh, all the beta-like globin genes uh, are sequentially expressed. Uh, and in particular, soon after birth, uh, the fetal gamma globin genes, uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2, are silenced uh, and when the adult beta globin gene is predominantly expressed. Uh, so during fetal life, we have the fetal hemoglobin that is composed by two gamma chain and two alpha chain, uh, while we have the adult hemoglobin in adult life. And so the high level of expression of these genes, uh, I remind you that we have 15 grams of hemoglobin in our blood per deciliter, is guaranteed thanks to the presence uh, of uh, a group of enhancers that are located upstream of all these genes uh, that are uh, together from the so-called beta-globin locus control region or uh, LCR. And so sickle cell disease is a genetic disease uh, that is caused by one single and unique point mutation uh, that uh, causes uh, the substitution of valine for glutamic acid uh, in position six of the beta globin chain. And this leads to polymerization of the sickle hemoglobin, uh, which in turn causes uh, formation of sickle shaped red blood cells. Uh, that uh, tend to obstruct small bus, uh, vessels, uh, leading to um, multi-organ damage. And in addition, uh, uh, these uh, uh, sickle red blood cells are also very fragile, uh, and so they uh, tend to uh, be realized in the, in the bloodstream, uh, and so the clinical phenotype is also associated with anemia. Well, uh, in sickle cell disease, uh, more than 400 mutations have been described uh, to reduce uh, or completely abolish beta globin synthesis. Um, and this uh, leads uh, to the precipitation of the uncoupled alpha globin, which in turn causes uh, ineffective erythropoiesis, uh, apoptosis of red blood cell precursors, uh, but also that of mature red blood cells. Um, and so the main aspect of this disease uh, is uh, actually anemia. And so uh, we know that uh, there are uh, er more than 350,000 children that are born every year with uh, genetic hemoglobin disorders, uh, and most of them are actually affected by these beta hemoglobinopathies. Uh, so in particular, most of these uh, 370,000 newborns are actually affected by sickle cell disease. And so the typical treatment uh, are the transfusion of red blood cells from healthy donor and the pharmacological treatment, uh, uh, which however are, are uh, not equally effective in all the patients uh, and still they are lifelong therapies. And therefore, the only curative and uh, definitive treatment uh, is the transplantation uh, of uh, hematopoietic stem cells uh, from a compatible donor. So the transplantation of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cells, uh, or HSCs, uh, that then uh, give rise into the patient uh, to normal red blood cells. Um, However, unfortunately, this approach is available only to a small fraction of the patients, uh, so the ones that are lucky enough to have a compatible donor. I just want to point out that the HSC-based therapy uh, are definitive therapy, and this is because uh, the hematopoietic stem cells, by definition, uh, is, able, uh, is a cell that is able to engraft uh, in a patient, in our case, uh, and reconstitute all the hematopoietic system, uh, including the red blood cells uh, compartment. Uh, on the contrary, for patient, uh, red blood cells have a short half life, uh, and so for patients who do not uh, undergo allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, uh, the, this patient needs to receive red blood cell transfusion that need to be continuously readministered uh, because of the short half life. 
Um, so, however, for patients lacking a compatible donor, uh, uh, an alternative uh, uh, promising strategy is the gene therapy. Uh, which is uh, uh, currently based on the transplantation uh, of uh, autologous, so of patient uh, genetically corrected hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and uh, the initial, this, in, this approach was initially based uh, on the use of a uh, lentiviral vector uh, uh, inserting uh, and integrating uh, a beta globin transgene, a wild type beta globin transgene, into uh, hematopoietic stem cells. Um, um, however, in the last decades, uh, uh, many genome editing approaches have been uh, developed, uh, uh, most, and uh, some of them are already in clinics. Uh, and uh, most of these approaches are based on the use of the uh, famous CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease system, uh, but there are also novel uh, uh, editing strategies that have been developed, uh, in particular using uh, uh, these uh, base editors. And so uh, in lentiviral vector uh, gene addition strategy, we need to insert uh, a beta globin transgene in, in the frame of a lentiviral vector. And then this beta globin tra uh, transgene is under the control uh, of the, um, uh, the uh, promo an erythroid specific promoter and the erythroid specific enhancer that comes usually from the locus control region. So usually we take two, three enhancer element uh, and we insert them uh, in the lentiviral vector just to create uh, a mini locus control region. And then the lentiviral vector uh, is able to integrate this therapeutic cassette in HSCs uh, that should uh, then give rise, hopefully, to uh, normal uh, red blood cells. And so there are uh, um, many clinical studies that have been conducted using uh, this uh, lentiviral vector and this strategy. And uh, uh, in particular, these are the result of a trial that was initiated uh, in Paris at the Necker Hospital. Uh, and we have recently published the study of the long term, the result of the long term study. And this was a trial that was sponsored by Bluebird Bio. And so, as you can see, this, uh, this uh, strategy was very, very effective in many patients, in many beta thalassemia patients, uh, and in particular in patients uh, who have uh, some mutation that do not completely abolish beta globin synthesis. Uh, so this patient error has uh, still some residual beta globin expression, and let's say we know that they are easy to, to, to correct. Uh, for example, these are uh, these uh, three patients that have this uh, beta E mutation that still allows uh, some residual expression of beta globin. Indeed, uh, these three patients, after treatment, uh, they showed good levels of hemoglobin uh, and amelioration of the clinical phenotype. And uh, this type of therapy is, is currently on the market, uh, uh, unfortunately, only in US and not in Europe, uh, with the name of uh, Zinteglo and uh, uh, the cost of $2.8 million. Um, however, for patients that have uh, a more severe deficit of beta globin, such as patients with uh, this uh, IVS1-110 mutation uh, that strongly downregulate beta globin, this treatment is not uh, uh, always effective. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, the patient had the low uh, hemoglobin levels, uh, and the patient is still transfusion dependent. Uh, so this patient can be cured uh, at the end, uh, but uh, still we need to uh, insert into the hematopoietic cell cells uh, a higher number of vector copy to produce more hemoglobin. Well, uh, these are the result of uh, two clinical uh, uh, gene therapy trials for sickle cell disease. Uh, so one is, uh, was sponsored by Bluebird Bio, and the second one is an academic trial that we made with our own vector. And again, also in this study, the levels of therapeutic hemoglobin were variable, and then as a consequence, also the clinical, uh, the correction of the clinical phenotype. Uh, and in particular, in patients with the lower therapeutic hemoglobin expression, uh, which was caused because of the lower number of vector copies that we were able to insert into stem cells. Uh, so in this patient, uh, the clinical benefits were less evident, uh, or I would say almost absent. And so, basically, just to summarize, uh, the cons of these uh, lentiviral-based gene addition therapies are uh, uh, mainly three. So the suboptimal expression of the therapeutic globin, uh, Indeed, we think that this can be is caused because uh, the lentiviral vector cannot accommodate the entire locus control region uh, that is necessary to achieve high level of expression of the endogenous beta globin genes. Um, 
And in addition, another con is the potential genotoxicity as this uh, lentiviral vector, they integrate semi-randomly into the genome uh, and uh, uh, they integrate mainly into genes. Uh, and of course, this risk uh, can uh, be even increased when we need to insert, uh, such as in our case, multiple copies of the vector in the cells to achieve a clinical benefit. And of course, last but not least, the high cost of this therapy are really a barrier for the widespread use of this therapy. And these are due to the uh, manufacturing of the lentiviral vector, uh, the culture, or the ex vivo culture of the cells, uh, and also the transplantation procedure. And therefore, genome editing has been explored uh, to basically correct the endogenous uh, loci and uh, so taking advantage of the endogenous gene regulation to achieve high level of globin expression. And in particular, many groups have used the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease system that, uh, as you uh, know, might know, it generates a double strand break in a specific region in the of the genome uh, that is then repaired thanks to the uh, homologous direct repair pathway using a donor template carrying the desired edits. Um, and in this case, this pathway can be explored, for example, to correct uh, the disease-causing mutation. Alternatively, uh, this uh, uh, double strand break uh, can be, um, correct, can be uh, repaired uh, thanks to the non-homologous engineering pathway that then leads to the uh, generation of a small insertion and deletion. Uh, and this, uh, therefore, can be used uh, to inactivate genes uh, or cis regulatory elements. Um, so the advantage of this strategy are probably the high, globin, a high level of, globin of endogenous globin expression if we directly correct the mutation at the endogenous gene. Regarding the cost, we still don't have uh, really a number, but they might be lower because usually the delivery of the system is not made with a viral vector. And then regarding the genotoxicity, this type of strategy are targeted strategy. We just targeted a specific locus uh, uh, compared to lentiviral vector that integrate everywhere in the genome. Uh, but still, as I will uh, discuss briefly uh, uh, later during my talk, uh, still I think genotoxicity for the, in this case needs to be carefully evaluated. And therefore, uh, genome editing has been explored to directly correct the, um, the um, disease causing mutation, uh, in particular using nucleases uh, that uh, generate uh, a double strand break in the mutant gene uh, that is then repaired thanks to a donor template carrying the wild type globin sequence. Um, and there are two clinical trials in US that are about to start using this strategy. However, the HDR pathway that is used in these uh, gene correction approaches uh, is less efficient than the non-homologous engineering pathway in HSCs, uh, which are the target cell population in gene therapy approaches. Uh, and in addition, this approach requires the delivery of a donor template, which might be complex. And therefore, uh, uh, many editing approach uh, aim at uh, reactivating the expression of the fetal gamma globin genes uh, that are usually silenced uh, soon after birth. And this is because uh, uh, the severity of both beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease uh, is mitigated by the persistent synthesis of fetal gamma globin in adult life, uh, which is uh, typically associated with the genetic variants uh, that are termed hereditary persistent of fetal hemoglobin uh, or HPFH mutations. So in particular, uh, HPFH mutation uh, mapping to the promoter of the two gamma globin genes uh, are mainly point mutation. Uh, and they either uh, generate uh, DNA motif uh, that uh, are uh, then recognized by transcriptional activator uh, that then occupy the gamma globin promoter and activate gene expression, or they disrupt the binding site for transcriptional repressor that then can no longer occupy the gamma globin promoter and repress gene transcription. And so uh, to, uh, the gamma globin in particular in adult uh, cells uh, and in adult patient cells uh, can, uh, in beta thalassemia, can improve the uh, globin gene imbalance uh, basically by replacing uh, uh, the beta globin and by compensating for beta globin deficiency. While uh, in sickle cell disease, uh, gamma globin, once incorporated into the hemoglobin tetramer, it is able to prevent hemoglobin polymerization uh, and therefore red blood cell cycling. 
And there are uh, several nuclear factors that are known uh, to be involved uh, in, this, uh, uh, in the repression of the fetal gamma globin gene in uh, adult life. Uh, and in particular, BCL11 and LRF are the major transcriptional repressor that in adult cells bind the gamma globin promoter and repress gene transcription. Therefore, our first uh, um, strategy was to use uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease system uh, to basically uh, knock out BCL11, the transcription factor that represses gamma globin. And this uh, can be achieved by um, inactivating its enhancer uh, by basically deleting a portion of this enhancer in order to inactivate it. Uh, and this uh, could be done by generation deletion of this enhancer uh, that uh, can be generated through the non-homologous engineering pathway, which is highly efficient in HSCs. And in addition, uh, this strategy does not need uh, the delivery of a donor template, uh, and there are many clinical trials that are actually using exactly this strategy and this target uh, that are ongoing. So these are only some of the, the first uh, clinical trials uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease uh, that were uh, run by Sangam and Vertex uh, for both beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease patients. And last year, the first result of the uh, Vertex trial uh, was published, uh, and in particular, a beta one beta thalassemia patient uh, and uh, one uh, uh, sickle cell disease patient uh, reached uh, near uh, normal or nearly normal hemoglobin levels, uh, uh, thanks to the fetal gamma globin reactivation uh, that is indicated here in blue. And so also they show uh, amelioration, uh, uh, substantial amelioration of the clinical phenotype. A second strategy that can be used uh, to uh, reactivate fetal gamma globin uh, is to use the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, nuclear system, uh, this time to evict from the gamma globin promoter uh, the LRF transcriptional repressor, basically by deleting its binding site. Uh, and so we will mimic, in this case, the effect of HPFH mutation. And uh, again, also this strategy takes advantage of the non-homologous and joining pathway, which is highly active uh, in uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And so we do not need, uh, again, a donor DNA template. Uh, and in some of these trials, they are also testing this, uh, a very similar strategy. Um, however, all these uh, nucleus-based strategy have a major drawback, uh, that is the fact that in, they indeed generate DNA double strand break into the genome, uh, that, they can, uh, in, that can induce a DNA damage response leading to apoptosis. Uh, and in addition, it has been recently shown that the CRISPR-Cas9 nucleus system uh, can generate uh, large genomic rearrangements, uh, such as uh, large deletion, translocation, or even chromosome loss. And therefore, the general idea in the field is to develop double strand break free strategies, uh, either using a base editor that can make C to T or A to G conversion without generating double strand breaks, um, or prime editing, which is a less developed technology that, however, can make all base conversion. Or finally, epigenome editors uh, that can activate or inactivate genes. Um, as they contain an effector that can uh, deposit uh, or remove uh, marks of active or inactive transcription, uh, such as histone modification and DNA methylation. And I will uh, mainly discuss about uh, the base editing technology that uh, was developed by Professor David Liu at the Broad Institute. Um, and in particular, base editors uh, uh, can make this C to T or A to G base conversion without generating double strand breaks as they contain an inactivated Cas9 nuclease, uh, so no double strand break, fused to a deaminase that is the enzyme that can make the C to T or the A to G conversion. And uh, therefore, base editing has been exploited uh, to uh, correct the sickle cell disease mutation uh, and also some uh, thalass beta thalassemia causing mutation. As it does not induce double strand break, uh, we don't need a donor template, uh, and it has been recently shown that this process can be highly efficient uh, in hematopoietic stem cells. And so base editors, unfortunately, they cannot re revert the sickle cell disease mutation, so they cannot convert an A to a T, but we can use adenine base editor to convert the mutant A into a G. 
generating the hemoglobin Makassar variant that has an alanine in position 6 instead of a glutamic acid. But this hemoglobin is a benign variant that should have the same properties of normal hemoglobin. And so we know that hemoglobin polymerization uh, occurs because uh, the valine in position 6 uh, of the um, beta, sickle beta globin uh, interacts with an hydrophobic pocket present on an adjacent hemoglobin tetramer. However, we predicted that the alanine in position 6 of the Makassar hemoglobin is not bulky enough to fit in this pocket. And it was shown back in the 90s uh, in the lab of Claude Poyart and uh, Stuart Edelson here in Paris that indeed hemoglobin Makassar cannot polymerize. And so gen uh, generating the Makassar mutation, it was not an easy task and it requires a, required a lot of uh, protein engineering and optimization. But at the end, we were able to achieve around 90% of, uh, uh, of base conversion in an erythroid cell line harboring the sickle cell disease mutation. And this strategy has been uh, successfully tested uh, by the group of uh, Mitch Weiss uh, and uh, uh, David Liu in human hematopoietic stem cells from sickle cell disease patients. Uh, so they were able to achieve a high level of genome editing efficiency, around 80%, uh, and a good expression of the Makassar beta globin, uh, as uh, this one depicted in blue. And this led to the correction of the sickling phenotype, so with a reduced frequency of sickling cells, uh, of sickle cells in the uh, samples treated with the, um, expressing the Makassar beta globin. And then in our lab, we, we focus uh, on the most prevalent beta thalassemia causing mutation. Uh, and we started with the IVS1-110 mutation that I mentioned before, that is actually is inserting a splice acceptor site uh, in the first intron of the beta globin gene. And this leads to partial intron retention uh, and the generation or the usage of uh, premature stop codon uh, that causes a strong beta globin regulation associated with a severe clinical phenotype. And therefore, Julia in my lab, she treated the hematopoietic stem cells from beta thalassemic patients, uh, from two patients that were homozygous from this mutation, and a third patient that is a compound heterozygous for this mutation, and another beta thalassemia causing mutation. And she achieved uh, good uh, levels uh, of uh, editing efficiency, around 80%. Uh, and then the, the cells, the hematopoietic stem cells, were differentiated toward uh, the erythroid lineage. Um, and RT-PCR showed uh, a reduced level, so significantly reduced level of the aberrant mRNA, which are typically uh, characterized by a lower mobility because of the partial intron retention. And then uh, HPLC analysis showed a good expression of the wild type beta globin uh, uh, after the treatment, this one in red. Uh, and flow cytometry show rescue of beta thalassemic erythroid precursors uh, from apoptosis uh, and an improved enucleation rate, uh, reaching uh, levels that uh, were similar to those observed uh, in healthy donor samples. And finally, we also tested the base editors uh, to basically reactivate fetal gamma globin uh, and uh, for all these reasons that I mentioned to you before. And as they can be uh, used to precisely insert uh, HPFH mutation uh, that disrupt the binding site for transcriptional repressor or HPFH mutation uh, that create binding site for transcriptional activators. And therefore, uh, in, to give you a little bit more in detail, uh, cited in base editor can make the C2T mutation. Uh, and so they can be used to generate uh, these four um, HPFH mutation uh, in the minus 200 region of the gamma globin promoters uh, that, can, uh, that are known to reduce the binding of the LRF transcriptional repressor. And uh, similarly, adenine based editor can make the NA to G conversion. And so, in the very same region, uh, they can be used to reproduce uh, the minus 98 so called British HPFH mutation uh, that uh, generate a KLF1 activator binding site. And so Panayotis in my lab, uh, he disrupted the LRF binding site uh, or uh, he created the KLF1 binding site. Uh, reaching efficiency ranging between 40 and 50 percent, uh, with no indels uh, that are typically generating after double strand break, uh, such as using the Cas9, uh, our Cas9 previously developed strategies. Um, 
And HPLC analysis uh, showed uh, fetal hemoglobin reactivation in all the samples, uh, which was even higher when we generated uh, the KLF1 activator binding site. Um, and in all the cases, uh, we were able to achieve a sufficient uh, fetal hemoglobin level to rescue the cyclin phenotype. And we also tested this strategy in beta thalassemic hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, and uh, again, we observed increased gamma globin level, uh, reduced the uh, frequency of apoptotic cells, uh, and an improved enucleation. And uh, in this final, in this study, we tried to go a little bit more in detail to study the safety of this approach. Um, and uh, importantly, the P53 induced DNA damage response that is typically observed uh, in Cas9 nucleus treated samples uh, was absent uh, in uh, base edited samples treated with ABE or very modest in samples treated with CBE. And in addition, uh, we also analyzed the transcriptom of edited cells versus uh, untreated samples, uh, and we observed uh, fewer transcriptomic changes uh, in base edited cells compared to the cells treated with the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclear system. Uh, and in particular, when we used adenine base editor to generate the KLF1 binding site, the only changes that we observed were the expected one. So increase in fetal gamma globin levels and reduce level of, of uh, the uh, adult beta-like globin genes. And so finally, for the base editing part, uh, I think that we can use uh, base editing definitely to develop gene correction strategies, uh, which of course are mutation specific, however, but we can also use base editors to uh, reactivate fetal gamma globin. And this has the advantage of representing a universal strategy for both sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, independently of uh, from the uh, specific uh, mutation. And we are currently comparing these two strategies. Um, however, I would like to point out that still a lentiviral based approach, uh, we have seen every day that they can really ameliorate the clinical phenotype, uh, but unfortunately they are not currently available uh, in Europe. Uh, and in addition, CRISPR-Cas9 nucleus strategies uh, are in clinics uh, with the early promising clinical result. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, uh, safety issues related to the DNA damage have no, has not been uh, reported. But finally, we think that base editing uh, is uh, a promising strategy and has many advantages. Uh, and indeed, there are clinical trials that uh, will start soon uh, using this strategy. And so uh, finally, we'll just say a few words on the very, very future uh, uh, medicine for uh, this disease and for many other diseases. Uh, uh, so the prime editing and the epigenome editing technology that are currently being explored and optimized uh, for example, prime editing, uh, as it can induce all base conversion uh, differently from base editing, it can allow to precisely correct uh, the sickle cell disease mutation and to correct many more thalassemia causing mutation. Uh, and while epigenome editors can be used, for example, to activate uh, the gamma globin promoter, uh, for example, by depositing active isomark mark uh, or by removing repressive isomark mark from the gamma globin promoter. And finally, I think every approach that I discussed today is an ex vivo approach where we collect uh, hematopoietic stem cells from the patient, uh, we uh, culture them in the lab, uh, and then we re retransplant them into the patient that are also receiving, in the meantime, chemotherapy to make space in the bone marrow. This is definitely a complex and costly procedure. So the idea now in the field is to develop an in vivo strategy based on the mobilization of hematopoietic stem cells in, into the blood where they are more accessible to treatment, followed by the uh, intravenous injection of, uh, for example, viral vector or nanoparticle, specifically targeting HSCs. And we think that this uh, will uh, reduce a lot the complexity of the gene therapy procedures and also the cost. Uh, so this could really allow the, wide, the widespread use of uh, these gene therapy approaches. And so finally, I would like to thank the members of my lab at the Imaging Institute, the, uh, from the local and the European funding agency and the national and international collaborator, and of course the clinician uh, and patient, especially at the Necker Hospital, uh, and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anna-Rita, for this fascinating talk and insight into uh, gene therapy approaches in thalassemia and sickle cell um, anemia. Um, are there questions from the audience? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. So I was wondering about the um, kind of off-target differential gene expression, CRISPR-Cas9, and the rearrangement. When you dive into that, is it linked to the homology of sequence, to the target you have, and kind of affinity of the, yeah, so it's you know, CRISPR, even though it's specific, you know, nothing is 100% mm -mm. specific? Yeah, so basically it's mainly due to, it's, we have on-target uh, yeah. um, genotoxicity and we have off-target genotoxicity. So what we are discussing is mostly off-target uh, activity. So basically instead of recognizing the gamma globin promoter, one of our approach recognized the JAK2 gene, which yeah. is not good. <laughs> so we have to exclude it and we can ameliorate that because there are enzymes that are more precise. What is more scary is the on-target because uh, you know, if you think that this is a chromosome and you make a cut in the beta globin gene, you can lose the end of the chromosome. And this is an extremely rare event. Uh, and I mean, in patients, we don't have any data so far. And probably, I hope that these cells that lose a chromosome will just die. So that's the idea. But uh, if you lose, uh, I don't know, a piece uh, at the end of the chromosome beta, you have screw up the imprinting genes. So I mean, it's not really, you can still have some. Uh, but it, it will not happen in every cell that you uh, CRISPR-Cas9. No. So you could scream them out in the autolo autologous. Uh, uh, for uh, we don't have uh, a way f when okay. if you were expressing something in stem cells, yeah. then we could have. Uh, I mean, if globin was expressing stem cells, we could have kind of uh, I don't know inserted a cassette uh, to yeah. be sure that we are we have everything. But it's very hard. Uh -huh. okay. Thanks. Are there further questions? Perhaps one question from my side is: You have mentioned the different approaches, starting from the lentivirus approach, uh, further on to the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease approach and the base 8 adding approach. Uh, do you think that um, several approaches will develop simultaneously uh, and there will be different approaches uh, in the future healthcare? Or do you think that sort of there will be a strong focus on a certain approach in the future? Mm. No, I think that uh, probably lentiviral vector, unless the costs are reduced, will will be gone, uh, unfortunately. But uh, and still uh, now we don't have this therapy in Europe, which is very sad, unfortunately. The other approach, I think, no. The, I think the more approaches we have, the better it is, especially for this disease for which uh, just in France we have 25,000 sickle cell disease patients. So there will be more company that will uh, will be involved. So that that's definitely good. And I think that we also should really go to a personalized medicine at a certain point because I believe that also the genetic, I didn't show data, but I think that also the genetic background can tell you, okay, maybe I reactivate gamma globin or no, maybe in this beta thalassemia patient it's much better to correct the mutation. So I think that these, uh, there are studies that are ongoing to arrive at this point. That's really a very interesting aspect because sort of, it adds even more a personal medicine approach mm. that you have to reflect also yeah. the... For example, uh, uh, if you think about sickle cell disease patients, there are the some patients that have, mm -hmm. uh, are doing well and some patients that they are not. Uh, and so there is this idea of the in vivo gene therapy and even in the in utero gene therapy. But nowadays we cannot choose the patient to treat in utero because some of the patients can be, can be really just doing fine. I do see another question, Monica. Please. Thank you. Okay, yes, uh, we have the, a question from online. So <laughs> just to remind everyone that we are also Hello. online and there's a possibility to ask a question. So we have a question from uh, Christine Adamo uh, from, from our online participants. Uh, so first of all, uh, she thanks you for the great talk um, and the, that you have a quite remarkable uh, results. And um, she wants to know if it is possible to give patients who are already adults a gene therapy. Um, so if this is age relevant, so if it, if it is only children that can get a gene therapy or could it be adults or all ages are included? 
Uh, we start with adults, like all the gene therapy trials, but we are going, what we are trying to do is to even do always the younger people now because uh, they are doing better, their bone marrow is doing much better and you can better engraft the cells. So the advice overall is to go to uh, younger children. Okay, great. And the second question is regarding the therapy that uh, reactivate the gamma globin expression. Does it have any side effects? Hmm, Since it uh, is not 100% uh, what should be there in the blood at adult life. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, analyzing the patient with 100% of fetal hemoglobin would be great. And I think uh, and coming back to the question of the, the personalized medicine, you can think that if you are a woman and you have 100% of HBF, uh, you will give oxygen to your baby. And so there are some few studies on some strange journals saying that uh, already if you have a good 30% um, of fetal hemoglobin, your baby is small. And so probably, I mean, I would not uh, probably suggest this kind of therapy if you are a woman. I mean, it's a bit personalized, let's say. Mm. Thank you. There is another question. Here. Yeah, okay. sure. I have, I have a very naive question. Um, you mentioned several times cost as an issue. I know. And, <laughs> because it but, is. But I think it's a lot of these techniques, like the CRISPR-9, CAS, and these are, are very well established by now. Could you just elaborate a little bit? What are the main cost drivers in this? So I asked last week to Vertex uh, how much will be the cost, uh, because that's a question, uh, and they told me that they will tell me at the end of 2023. Uh, so what I suspect, because we are also trying to develop it, and so I, I think there will be at least a threefold reduction in the cost, uh, but, um, but the transplantation procedure is still there. And the, the point is that because uh, at least for some of the therapy, we are just electroporating the system, so we are not using viral vector. While, uh, uh, to give you an example, in the last trial of the Drepaglub trial, to treat four patients, uh, only the vector cost two million euros. So, so I think that the vector is a problem. So CRISPR-Cas9 might be less expensive uh, for that reason, hopefully. Yeah, I, I have a question, if possible. So it was, it's not really related to the technique, but I, sickle cell anemia, for example, is a typical problem in, more in, in Africa still, for example, compared uh, to, to Europe. Um, how do you see the importance, for example, for this kind of disease and also for development of therapies or for understanding the mechanism to collaborate uh, internationally? So currently, if I saw it correctly, it's mainly European collaboration partners you are having. So how do you see this importance of international collaboration at this stage or later? No, it's uh, super important. So for that, we are uh, collaborating with Caring Cross, uh, that is uh, mostly funded by Gates Foundation. And so it's a non-profit organization. Uh, who, and the idea is to uh, bring to, for now, to India and to uh, some countries in Africa gene therapy. And uh, the idea is to, there are many groups in the world, including us, that are, uh, that are working on uh, finding the best therapy and, with the, and reducing the production cost. Uh, and so the, the funding are uh, uh, not for making clinical trials in Paris, but it's really India and Africa for the moment. So, and there are very a lot of people that are working on that, uh, starting from the, the technology till the production of the vector in this case, till the, um, the, the analysis that you need to do, uh, the digitalized analysis that you can do after uh, with the patient, because this is also a problem. So this, uh, I mean, will not fix everything, but at, at least uh, there, is, uh, there are some non-profit organizations that are working on that, and most of the scientists are collaborating with that. Okay, perhaps a last question from my side. When you're starting these academic clinical trials, um, do you face challenges regarding ethical approval of the clinical studies? Uh, can you tell uh, a little bit about that? Not for uh, the approval, because we already run uh, the Bluebird Bio trial. Uh, the, the now what uh, we so the problem was the money, of course, uh, but we managed to collaborate with a company partially with a company, and uh, so the interaction with the uh, local agency, which is the ANSM in France, was good. Uh, what I hope that it will ameliorate is that uh, when, uh, for example, now we are trying to change the lentiviral vector to treat uh, uh, the last patient of the trial, uh, 
And the problem of uh, EMA or ANSM is that they ask you to repeat all the preclinical studies, even if you do a minimal change. This, I think, that at least at the level, European level is changing uh, because they, they understand that, uh, I mean, we cannot afford uh, all these preclinical studies uh, for minimal changes uh, for which uh, scientifically it's not really necessary. I hope this will change uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you for this fascinating keynote lecture. And I think there okay. will be the chance to get in contact with you during the next coffee break. Thank you thank so much. You.